Uh, let me introduce Helen Jordan, who's a lecturer at South Lanarkshire College. She came um, across our radar a few months ago, and it was just wonderful because she then uh, produced a wonderful mini bite for us, which, um, Kenji, I don't know if you're able to put the link to the mini bites in the chat at any point. Uh, if you can, I would appreciate that. But um, you may feel after today's session, you don't need to go to the mini bite series, but I would recommend that you do go along and see those six minute videos that we've been putting together. One of which, as I've already said, is by Helen. So I'm going to hand over to Helen. Helen, if you want to tell people about yourself, please do so. Um, but I don't really want to take any more time up from your presentation. No, not a problem. Um, I'll be speaking a, 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 a mile to the dozen trying to get uh, uh, neurodiversity, autism and ADHD in 30 minutes. So this will probably be a world first. Um, and I've got my timer at the ready to stop talking. Uh, I'm a lecturer at South Lanarkshire College. Uh, I mostly teach um, adults with additional support needs. Uh, my background, I, I, um, I kind of specialise in autism and ADHD. Um, my, um, I, my family um, are affected. My um, son has ADHD, my daughter has autism, and I also have ADHD. Um, so my interest in studying that um, came from personal experience um, and also I've got my postgraduates in it as well so I've got a, a real special interest in it um, so I'm sorry it's so short I've only got half an hour but you now know where I am and you can email me questions or anything about anything anytime quite happy to receive them. Okay I'm just going to um, start with a general chat about what it means to be neurodiverse. <clears throat> So the expression being neurodiverse um, came about in the late 90s, which is like 10 minutes ago in like kind of real time when we're talking about uh, any kind of um, changes to mental health, the way we talk about mental health or disorders or anything like that. Um, and it was Judy Singer that coined the phrase, um, she was an Australian sociologist and she, she kind of started talking about, well, people who are neurodiverse don't necessarily have some kind of flaw you know, they're not something wrong that needs fixed. You know, it's just, uh, we all have different brains and this is just one way of thinking. Um, so that was to give a kind of a positive, more empowered view of looking at uh, people with, who are neurodiverse. Um, so yeah, it's used as a mean of, means of empowerment um, to really promote the positive qualities uh, possessed um, by people who are neurodivergent. Um, it rejects that kind of negative view, like um, I think we we're talking about neurotypical and neurodiverse. There's kind of there's a kind of them and us view that uh, being neurotypical is the way we all strive to be, and it's the correct way to be, um, which is it's not true. We're beginning to realise well, actually, that's not true. People who are neurodiverse have got a lot to offer. Um, there's just like everybody else, we all have our strengths and our weaknesses. So we're moving away from the, the use of the, the um, term disorder. I personally don't like the use of ADHD as an expression because I don't consider myself as somebody who has a disorder. Um, so we, I think that's something that we might see changed in the future uh, when people begin to you know, really embrace the, the whole neurodiverse, uh, positive aspects of being a bit different from the majority. So it's estimated that around one in seven people, more than 15% of people in the UK have neurodevelopmental differences, including autism and ADHD, eh, which are observed when they learn and process information in a particular way. That's the kind of official stance. Personally, I think it's way, way much higher than that. Um, I think there's an awful lot of people who are neurodiverse who don't know they're neurodiverse. I think it's hard to get a diagnosis. Uh, I think especially in ADHD, uh, a lot of people, a lot of women now my age or younger, you know, a bit younger, are beginning to realise, you know, there's there's more education about it. So they're beginning to realise that actually um, that kind of fits me. So through more education, people are beginning to see that, um, you know, with autism, for example, my daughter, uh, you know, would walk in here just now and she would chat, she would talk to everybody, she would look you in the eye, everything's, and she's got autism. 
So you don't have to be stemming in a corner to have autism. You know, everybody's different. Uh, and I think people are beginning to get a bit more educated regards, with regards to that. So um, the term neurodiversity is like a kind of an umbrella term. If you think of like dementia being the umbrella term for Lewy body and vascular and so on, neurodiversity is like the umbrella term of, of different kind of learning um, experiences. So uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is better known as ADHD, uh, dyspraxia, fetal alcohol syndrome, intellectual disability, Tourette syndrome, tic disorders, any specific learning disorder like dyslexia or dyscalculia, um, these kind of things that give a kind of specific difficulties in specific areas. Um, but um, there, there's that's just to name a few. There's so, so many of them. Um, Forgive me for talking really fast. I've got a lot that I want to fit in. This is like, it's very hard to cut down what I think is important to say. Um, so ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition uh, characterized by symptoms of inattention, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. You can get different types of it. You can get just AD, ADD, which you don't have the hyper with it. But sometimes the hyper is kind of hard to see, especially in women. So, you know, um, I tend not to bounce off walls, but the hyperactivity can come internally. Um, it's classed as a disability with regards to uh, any legal forums or applications or anything that is classed as a disability. It's a lifelong condition, you're born with it. Um, however, often hyper -sym symptoms um, calm down around about age 16. You'll see the hyper kind of calming down. However, in women, uh, it can be exacerbated kind of menopausally, um, depending, you know, hor hormonal changes can affect it also. But it, in general, when you're younger and you're, you're much more hyper, that kind of, it's, it's, you can, it's really obvious to see it calming down. Um, again, it affects about 5% of school-aged children. Yeah, I think it's way up there, way up there. And it is a hereditary condition. It is hugely heritable. This wee bit just fascinates the life out of me. ADHD genes function like physical traits, more than cognitive or emotional ones in terms of heritability. So for example, height is passed on through a 95% genetic contribution. I'm five foot three, my husband's six foot five. So in all the wedding photos, his family are all up there and I look tiny. And then my family are all down here and he looks massive. So, you know, it's quite obvious to see with something like how, how, um, how genes affect the family and how that's passed through. So for things like intelligence, around about 55%. Um, when I'm giving statistics here, anywhere you go, we'll give a different version of it, you know, but in general, so I'm speaking in general, okay? Um, 35 to 40% for depression and personality traits, that kind of thing. The average for ADHD um, hereditary across studies is 75%, often showing up closer to 90%. Really, really high, which is why I started looking at myself, because I began to realise just how uh, important the genetic contribution was um, and I began to see things that I had just completely ignored for so many years. But uh, if you or you, if you've got a family member who's got autism or ADHD, uh, look at yourself and your husband or your family members, you know, because very, very often uh, there's a link there. Um, <clears throat> so the area of the brain affected, it's not, um, ADHD is not a, a behavioural issue. It's, it's a, an executive function issue. So, um, you know, the things that we use our executive function for is like um, reading the room. So when, when, you know, if we go into a, a room, we're able to see if people are friendly or hostile or, or that kind of thing. People with ADHD might not be picking up that quite as much. Predicting possible outcomes, uh, like for instance, if you're at a meeting and you realize you're, um, you know, you're talking too much, 
or you yeah, interrupt them too much and it's annoying people um, and being able to think, well, I won't do that again. I won't, that didn't work well for me. I won't do that again. Again, that's not as easy for a lot of people with ADHD. Uh, planning, uh, organising, um, initiating uh, appropriate action. So yeah, I want to get my I want to get my qualifications. So what I'll need to do is I'll need to you know that study timetable half an hour every night. I'll need to do this kind of thing. You know, uh, planning all that and initiating starting that plan can often for many people uh, be a challenge. Um, again, executive function, um, the information that's received from the environment, um, how you modify that information and output, um, these are all things that the executive function deals with and um, sometimes many people with ADHD can struggle. I'm sorry I'm speaking really fast here, I'm aware I've got five minutes in this section left. Emotional dysregulation. Uh, again, something that a lot of people with ADHD struggle with. Um, there's a big link between internalising behaviours, so like um, anxiety and stress, but a, a bigger link with externalising behaviours, which is why you'll often see uh, more antisocial behaviour, especially in uh, young people with ADHD. Um, and the more severe the ADHD, the more likely the inner turmoil will spill out externally. Um, for girls, um, very different for girls. Um, boys will be boys is, is kind of expression that we're all kind of used to. Um, so boys are kind of expected to a certain degree to bounce off walls. Girls aren't. Uh, from, from when girls are born, um, we have an entirely different expectation from society about what's expected of us. You know, uh, we're, not, we're expected to toe the line in so many ways that boys aren't. Boys, I'm not saying boys don't have their pressures, but um, this is girls, uh, this is why there's been so many more boys being diagnosed with ADHD because girls, although it's exactly the same ADHD, it's exactly the same issues, we are, we're getting all this input from society from the minute we're born uh, and girls have this inner, we know what's expected of us. And so girls are much more likely to mask. So the term expression masking means we'll, we'll put on a mask and, and try and act the way that society is expecting us to act. But that comes at a big price. Uh, through you'll, uh, A lot of times girls are diagnosed with uh, mental health issues, uh, with depression. Uh, oh, they're just moody. Uh, they're, just, uh, they're just over emotional. You know, that kind of thing, whereas that's more unusual to see in guys or expected of, if you know what I mean. Uh, substance misuse, again, much higher use uh, of um, substances um, with people with ADHD. Again, you know, so much I could say about that. Uh, teenagers who are not, uh, they're not fitting in, they're not coping with everything that's going on, often find themselves in deviant subgroups. Uh, and if you have that level of anxiety in your day-to-day -day life, you know, that constant, you know, anxiety, and the way a lot of substances are pushed on us in general, uh, people with ADHD have a much higher instance of substance abuse, which is linked to the reward pathway. So uh, I'll, I'll use alcohol as an example, but it could, it could um, apply to any drug. Um, so people with ADHD tend to be, um, they're, they're lacking in one of the chemicals, not the only chemical, but they're lacking in dopamine. And dopamine is linked to the reward pathway. So substances, for example, give you an elevated false um, dopamine um, reward. Uh, so that's why people, again, are more likely to take risks um, to get that dopamine link, uh, more likely to take substances, uh, more likely to do something, you know, make something exciting uh, because it, it's just lacking in somebody with um, ADHD. Um, so, for instance, in strategies for the do dopamine, a brilliant way, I live my life through timers. Uh, you know, I often use the example, I can't change my bed sheets without challenging myself to do it in four minutes it can't be done by the way but I challenged myself because what would normally with a neurotypical person knowing that they'll you know go into fresh bed sheets will give them enough of a dopamine hit to be able to do it 
as tiny as it is, it'll help them think, well, at the end of the day, I'm going to have a nice fresh bed to go into uh, and I'm going to feel really comfortable. But it's not enough for somebody with ADHD. It's just, it, which can make them seem lazy and unmotivated. It's just overwhelm. So setting a timer and trying to kind of make a game of it are brilliant ways to work with somebody with ADHD um, to help them stay on task, to give them enough dopamine to get moving, uh, breaking things down to bite-sized chunks, um, using visual prompts, lots of po positive expectations, praise and encouragement. Do you think of somebody, a child with ADHD, they're constantly criticised. They're doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to sit at peace. You're not supposed to talk too much. You know, and this is really hard for a person with ADHD because they grow up with that constant knock to their self-esteem. You're not good enough. So positive expectations is very important. Oh, I made that with 56 seconds to spare. Wow. I'm just going to reset that timer for autism. <laughs> Um, so autism, um, the same gene, it comes from the same gene as ADHD, okay, so in the past that they thought that that was a probable, it's now a definite, they have isolated the gene, it's called the MAP1A gene, and uh, it can it can mutate in, into either autism, ADHD, or both. Um, so autism, which is why you'll often see autism and ADHD in families. <clears throat> So it describes a broad range of condition characterized by challenges with social skills, repetitive behavior, speech, and non-verbal communication. And uh, like ADHD, the signs are evident from very early on. When I'm talking about both these conditions, I'm talking about um, some of the people some of the time, not all of the people all of the time. Every person is unique uh, as a, a neurotypical person and a neurodiverse person. So somebody with autism, as I say, you would never know my daughter had autism unless she told you, uh, because she's very, very good at masking, which comes at a huge price for our mental health. Um, I use now, when I studied uh, my postgraduate in autism, I, I was, um, I, it was forced into me to say uh, people with autism or who have autism. Uh, the autistic community generally don't like that because it suggests you have something wrong with you, you know, like you have depression or you have cancer, that kind of thing. I'm not suggesting that they're alike, but, you know, it's like you've got a something but you know, you know, it's like most people, a lot of people in the um, autistic community define themselves, this is just me, I'm autistic, and it's part of me. Um, way back in the day, they talked about their refrigerator mother, believe it or not, way back in the day, they talked about, um, you know, a mother being cold to her child, and, and that kind of, uh, that caused autism. We now know that that's absolutely debunked. I just saw this picture the other day, and I really, really liked it. You know, they talk about the autistic spectrum and they also, when people say things like, oh, everybody's a wee bit autistic or everybody's a wee bit ADHD. No, they're not. No, they're not. <laughs> um, and they talk about the autistic spectrum and it's as if you get, like, you talk, I think, that, you know, they've changed it. You don't have Asperger's anymore. You know, they don't talk about that anymore. Um, the American ICD, which is the manual that deals with mental health issues, um, changed that before the British did. But the British did in, in January, which is the DSM, and uh, they've changed it now, and they don't talk about Asperger's anymore. It's autism. And the reason being that, you know, it suggests that high-functioning autism or Asperger's, it's just you're a wee bit something. And it's not, it's like, the, I thought that image was quite good to show it. You know, it's like, you don't have a wee bit, you know, you have it as much or as least less than everybody else, but you've just got different ways of, you know, for instance, my daughter's social skills are pretty good, but our, um, our sensory um, um, way of deep processing is awful, uh, really, really poor. Um, so, you know, there's there's things like that. So it's like, I, I thought that was a nice way to describe how, you know, no, we're not all a wee bit like it, but if you have autism or ADHD, you're maybe coloured in a different way, uh, but it's not along a spectrum. Um, 
So in, in autism, a lack of delay in spoken language. Back in the day, they used to say if a child didn't speak by three, it was autism. If they spoke before three, it was Asperger's. Uh, that's not true anymore, but certainly a lack of uh, or a delay in spoken language can be a sign. A repetitive use of language, um, little to no eye contact, a lack of interest in peer relationships. If you watch children and you see the, the wee autistic child, uh, they'll tend to be quite happy on their own playing in a corner where neurotypical children tend to really, really need that social contact. Um, lack of spontaneous or make-believe play, a lot, of, a lot of play in young children can be quite repetitive. And a fixation with certain objects uh, or, or interests, you know, so it's like you'll want to know about dinosaurs, you know, as someone you know, who's interested in it is autistic. Um, can anybody tell me just, um, this is usually a group exercise that I do, but I'm not doing it here to, for time wise, but can anybody shout out to me what's going on in that picture? That here. Hen party. A yeah, hen party. Yep. So I was going to say a hen party. A hen party. And how are they all feeling about the hen party? Happy, fun, excited. Yeah. What about the wee women at the back? Mm. Yeah, she's clearly not sure. She's not Anxious. sure. Yeah, she's thinking, mm -mm, that looks a bit dodgy. Wait, I tell the women's knitting circle on Monday. <laughs> what she got up to. Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to talk too long about that, but what you did there is you basically saw, um, that's a painting by Beryl Reed, obviously, um, and you just basically looked at strokes of paint and assigned um, thoughts and feelings to those people, you know, uh, so, and that's called theory of mind. So theory of mind is the ability to attribute mental states. You know, you, you saw pain that, that looked like a human on a bit of paper, and you decided that that woman was not sure of that situation, you know, and, you know, her belief was that she thought that that was a bit, and I mean, that's what, we, that's what most of us do. We look at that and we know that we've all got beliefs, intents, desires, you know, knowledge, um, you know, and, and, and we're all, we've all got similar ideas, but we're all quite different. We're all unique. And a lot of people with, um, with autism, see, with autism, who have autism, a lot of autistic people uh, struggle with that often about you know what's going on in somebody's else or somebody else's mind so just a wee example what do we do to mind read throughout the day even in this meeting earlier on what have we done to mind read how do we do that take visual cues um listen to people's tone yep. uh, and a number of clues yep. that permeate yep. when we communicate yep Absolutely. So I'm in this meeting just now. So if, if I was a participant at this meeting and, uh, you know, I'm looking at my watch and that just, oh, I'm reading your mind that you're bored. You look bored. I'm picking up on that cue that you're bored. A lot of people with autism just won't pick that up. Uh, you know, it's just like, um, it's looking a bit disinterested. And you'll pick up in that that cue and you'll think, right, OK, I better stop talking or I better change the topic. Or so we're reading people's mind by thinking, how are you feeling? Are you engaging with what I'm saying? Are you picking up on that? Unfortunately, I can't pick up what you're thinking just now because I can't see anybody on the screen at the minute. Uh, but, you know, if, if people were sitting like that, I would start to worry that, oh, maybe this is boring. Maybe I'm talking too quick and so on. So we mind read all day. but. Uh, autistic people often struggle with that, which is why you'll often see uh, autistic people, what we perceive as doing something inappropriate or saying something inappropriate. It's just they've not picked up cues. Um, so these things, uh, for example, a lot of people with, uh, a lot of autistic people uh, uh, can be very literal. Um, so something like my head's about to explode. Uh, I'm so stressed. So i um, so uh, an autistic person could translate that as your head is about to explode. So uh, if you're talking to uh, an autistic person and you say, oh God, I'm so, I've been so stressed today, my head's about to explode. And all of a sudden, you know, there's a meltdown and you think, what on earth did I just say? Well, you said something actually quite scary, you know, that your head's about to explode. So, you know, you can change that about, um, 
Um, so what, what could you say instead of that? Maybe just, maybe just, I'm feeling really stressed today. You know, I've had a hard day. So, or if you do, I find admitting you're human can help as well. You know, if you say something about my head's a bit and say, I didn't mean that, that's a joke. You know, I'll sometimes do that in class because I'm a bit gobby and I say things. <laughs> I, I just blot out things, which is part of my ADHD, but I'll sometimes say things and then just say, um, eh, that was a joke, you know, and that kind of moves that, that kind of calms that situation. So my feet, feet are ice blocks. Autistic person would think, would be looking at your feet and thinking, no, they've got shoes on and they look like the shoes or we subtle things like okay, this is things that we use all the time would you like to move seats no i don't you think how rude how rude is that i only ask would you like to move seats? i'm asking you but you're not you're you're asking do you fancy do that would you like that no i don't but we're all we all talk in these wee nuances and these wee hints and it's not enough for an autistic person they need you to be very clear uh, fancy taking your gloves off, hanging up your coat and swapping with me? Mm? Too long? You need to break it all down? Please take your gloves off, hang your coat up, sit on that seat next to Amy. Amy, you sit there, being very, very specific about what it is you want. And it can sound more um, formal and a bit hard. Uh, because we are not used to talking that way, because we are used to talking in riddles and nuances. Uh, stand out the way. What does that mean? Out the way where? You know, stand there next to that seat. Uh, I want your work in sooner rather than later. Uh, when is that? Don't know what that means. Uh, fancy a cup? Do you want a cup of tea? Any chance you can sit next to Adam? No. You know, so if you've got somebody, uh, somebody that's autistic and they, they come across as rude, often you're just not explaining yourself properly. Uh, are you eating that? It's a good one. Are you eating that? That means going to gaze a bit. Uh, but for uh, an autistic person, that uh, that doesn't mean anything. Are you eating that? No. Uh, she's so rude, she just bit my head off. That could sound really frightening for somebody uh, with autism. Not sure. Let's just play it, play it by ear. <laughs> Read, read very specific things, you know, especially if I'm teaching people in a class, it would be, um, we will stop at um, 12 o'clock and uh, this is what we are going to do. And at 11 o'clock, we're going to do this. At 10 o'clock, we're going to do this and so on and so forth. Just be, being very specific. And once you've said it, you do it. You can't change it because you've said it. You've said you're going to do it. Um, <clears throat> that's a really good, I've got permission to share that in an educational setting, but um, it's a really good wee um, poster on females in the autistic spectrum, um, which fits uh, a lot of people. I, I just really like that one. It, just the differences between male and female. Um, and I have, um, again, women mask and, and they're good at coming across. They'll, they'll copy certain things. Um, I use my daughter as an example, uh, you know, as in she used to, one of her focuses at one point, her hyper focus was in the programme Friends. And she would copy the things that they said to fit in like, oh, my God. You know, that is so amazing or whatever it may be. And because she was picking up on how they behaved with one another. And so she picked up on that kind of um, that kind of um, voice intonation and so on. Yeah. Uh, being aware that, you know, you sometimes see people with um, I can't say that word and I try really hard. Proprioceptive proprioceptive the sense. So that's awareness of your body stance and awareness of how you stand. I actually. I, I met an absolutely brilliant woman with autism and her natural stance was to stand way, way back, almost bent backwards. And uh, that was what she was most comfortable standing in. And she had to really practice walking up straight with her head up uh, and, and really think about it. Um, so sometimes uh, uh, autistic people can look a bit kind of floppy or kind of um, stompy and things like that, uh, uncoordinated movement. So providing a chair with arms is just a really simple way to help that kind of um, that kind of movement and difficulties. Miscalculating the weight of something. So instead of saying, you know, going to pass me that cup, going to pass me the heavy cup, because you know how sometimes you go pick something up and, and it's the wrong kind of 
what you didn't you didn't expect it to be so light and it, you almost spill it kind of thing. So uh, kind of making that clear. Uh, again, um, it's not lazy or attention seeking the stomping. It's uh, often it's a sensory thing seeking sensory stimulation through walking and that's also the same for that kind of stimming you know you, you often see when somebody's excited and it's just I just don't know what you do with all that emotion and it's like a, a sensory um stimulation um uh, auditory processing um you know I've, I've been aware of your environment around you you know and is it too bright is it too noisy I'm very aware of that because my daughter's got a lot of these problems so things like emptying the dishwasher when she's around is a no-go because you think of the amount of battering and clanging that goes on with a dishwasher so can you make a calmer environment um and just a nice wee happy note Andre you know the world would be a really a duller place without autism and ADHD you know I've listed some names of some people who've contributed to the world Billy Connolly Will I Am Mozart Subo you know there's a lot of fantastically interesting uh, uh, clever people uh, who are neurodiverse and in my personal view I think that um the world, um, uh, uh, autism and ADHD are introduced as a way to bring um, um, the world forward. Because uh, when you look at all the, the inventions and the innovations in the world, um, and if you look at the person, that a lot of the times they have a neurodiversity. And, but that's my personal opinion. Maybe because I'm neurodiverse myself, I say that. But... <laughs> um, so that's that. Is there, if anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to, to answer. Oh, Helen, that was absolutely fantastic. Have a drink of water. That was brilliant. Wow. I'm sure lots of people will have questions. I could actually sit with you for the next 24 hours, I think, and just ask you questions.